that would be Wednesday after school. Uh, I cannot stay Wednesday after school. I have tutoring like right after school. All right. Uh, so history of life. Uh, we're gonna make a, a scale here. So this is going to be 5.0 billion years ago. This is 4.75. Each each uh, little mark in my paper is gonna represent um, 250 million years. So this is gonna be 250 million years. Okay, so that's 500. 475, 4, uh, 4.5, 4.25, 4 billion years ago. 3.75, 3.5, 3 billion years ago. Two point seven five, two point five, two point two five, two billion years ago. 1.75, 1 1.25, 1 1.25, 1 billion years ago. 750, 500 million, 250 million, and now. Okay, so the first thing we need to talk about is um, a shortcoming of humans, and that is uh, we are bad at large numbers, and um, so if I told you guys that something happened a million years ago, your brain says, yep, a million years, that's a long time, right? If I told you that something happened a billion years ago, you say, yep, a billion years, that's a long time. But what I want you to try to grasp for today is, is to think that the difference between a billion years and a million years is 999 million years, right? So a billion and a million are not even close to the same number, right? So when I say something happened a billion years ago or 1.4 billion years ago, and I say something happened 1.4 million years ago, those are not even close to the same. Those are very, 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 very different time periods, okay? So um, in the course of the geologic time scale, which is this here, uh, 1 million years represents basically nothing, right? Uh, the average amount of time that a species spends on Earth is around 200, or two, sorry, 2 million years, okay? So if we are at 2 million years, that's about average. There are some species that last four, some species that last 8 million years, but the average is around 2 million years, okay? So let's go through and put on some major events on here. Um, this is around 4.6 billion years that we're gonna start talking about first. That is going to be the formation of the Earth. 4.6 billion years ago. Okay, so 4.6 billion years ago, uh, the Earth is sort of hashing itself out. It's, it's cooling down. Uh, there's this other planet that's right next to Earth at this point called Thea. Um, Thea is slightly smaller than Earth, but not that small. And um, so they're sort of orbiting around the sun and, and kind of hashing out their orbits with each other. And then uh, they collide together. So Thea and the Earth collide together and most of uh, Thea gets deposited on Earth. It like breaks apart and becomes part of Earth. Uh, and the rest of Thea becomes what we now know as the moon, okay? This was a catastrophic event. It was extremely, extremely, uh, the, the impact force of, of this event was massive, more than we could even imagine, okay? Uh, if there was life on Earth prior to this, there would not have been life on Earth after this, okay? Um, however, as far as we can tell, there wasn't life on Earth here, okay? Now, the next spot that we put on here is um, quite a bit down, and I'm gonna put, instead of a dot here, a little bracket, Okay. And I'm going to say that this uh, is the first prokaryotes. Okay. And so this represents a range of around 3.5 billion years ago to 3.0 billion years ago. And the reason why there's this range is for a couple of reasons. First of all, um, we have never seen a prokaryotic skeleton. There's no such thing as a prokaryotic skeleton, right? You can't find a fossil of a prokaryote. But what you can find uh, are is evidence that prokaryotes may have lived in a certain area. They, they uh, when they form large colonies, sometimes they form little um, gas tubes 
Uh, and so the reason why there's a 500 million year gap here or 500 million year sort of range is because um, when we find these evidence, the small evidence of prokaryotes, uh, all we can do is date the, the rock around it. And so there's some um, controversy as to whether or not we should um, consider that the actual date of the rock or maybe those prokaryotes had just you know, burrowed down into that rock. So, you know, we have definite evidence that's around 3.0 billion years ago, but then um, we have seen some evidence that's next to rocks that are around 3.5 billion years old. And so there's a range here and it doesn't really matter because it's still a really, 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 really long time ago. Yeah. When you say evidence, like, I assume, like you're talking about fossils. Like yeah, they're not actual fossils of the organisms, but they're fossils of the structures that get created when large amounts of those organisms are in colonies. So like little tubes uh, that get created as, um, as colonies of bacteria uh, kind of work through them. There's also um, some more like honeycomb structures that exist because of colonies of bacteria. And these are the things that they're looking for when they're, when they're saying, okay, this is evidence of prokaryotic life. So it's not like a singular prokaryote. It's mm -hmm. like that would, that would never leave, it wouldn't leave a fossil. Exactly. And so you wouldn't be able to look at that and see something. Okay, so then we got a long period of time. 2.1 billion years ago is in our next mark. This is more down here. Okay, this is uh, the first uh, eukaryotes. That's around 2.1 billion years ago. So it took a really long time to get from prokaryotes to eukaryotes. Um, you know, by uh, the least conservative estimate here, the most conservative estimate here, uh, about 900 million years. By the least conservative estimate, over a billion years to get from prokaryotes to eukaryotes. Now, I didn't touch on this before, but um, there, besides like the Stanley Miller experiment where he like put all the stuff, the the um, primordial uh, gases into uh, the flask, and then you like shot electricity into them. You know, the Stanley Miller experiment. You guys read about that, right? Okay. Um, besides that, um, there's really been very little that explains how we got life from non-life, right? So there's almost no point in talking about it because even Stanley Miller's experiment was not talking about the creation of life. He was talking about the uh, creation of the molecules that could then turn into life, like RNA and DNA and uh, amino acids and things like that. So um, some of the uh, uh, ideas, some of the theories that are being thrown around here, there's this one um, for the first prokaryote, it's called the RNA world, where we started to have RNA molecules that could sort of self-replicate. And then um, they got put into these lipid droplets and the lipid droplets then um, sort of sequestered those RNAs together, right? That's one theory, right? But it's not a very good theory because then how does new RNA get into those lipid droplets, right? Um, there's also another very viable theory that life didn't begin on Earth, that life came from somewhere else uh, and came over on an asteroid. There was a, you know, a, a remnant of life from some other planet uh, that then crashed here on Earth and then seeded and, and um, caused all the different types of life to grow here on Earth. Um, there's more and more evidence, kind of, not evidence, but more and more uh, sort of backing being put into that because we're seeing how uh, robust certain species are of bacteria, how they can survive uh, in areas that they really shouldn't be able to. Uh, and um, so even currently, like we just sent uh, the Mars rover onto Mars, right? Well, we just colonized Mars with bacteria. Like there's bacteria on the Mars rover from Earth, right? And that bacteria now is on Mars and that will now have a different evolutionary background from Earth, right? Or evolutionary path from Earth because it's going to be living in a totally separate environment now, right? So give that another billion years on Mars and there's probably going to be life on Mars that is the result of humans sending these spacecraft to Mars, uh, even if humans never get to Mars ourselves. There's still going to be life on Mars evolving from bacteria, right? So anyways, um, we come down here a billion years or so, uh, first eukaryotes, and uh, over the course of a billion years, one time, somewhere, some or some um, prokaryote engulfed another prokaryote, didn't digest it, that became the mitochondria, that allowed for the prokaryote to become larger uh, because it now had more energy, more uh, a larger prokaryote, 
with that's now called the eukaryote, uh, has more plasma membrane. And because it has more plasma membrane, there's more spots available for infolding. More spots available for infolding lead to um, the infolding theory, which is where we got the rest of the organelles from. And we end up with eukaryotic life around this point, okay? Uh, there's really no uh, controversy as to the age of this. It's pretty set in stone around 2.1 billion years ago, uh, plus or minus about 1%, or sorry, 0.1%, okay? So, um, then we got multicellular organisms popping up around here around 1.4 million years ago. First, multicellular organisms. Again, 1.4 billion years ago. And these multicellular organisms, they are not like the multicellular organisms that we think about today. They weren't like fish and, and things like that. Uh, these were what we call colonial organisms. And uh, the colonial organisms, in order to understand it, you got to think about like a colony of humans, right? So the colony of humans here that, that came over to, to colonize the United States, uh, let's say uh, they all had different jobs, right? So there were some people we brought over because they were good Farmers. There were some people we brought over because they were good doctors. There were some people we brought over because they were good blacksmiths, right? And so they all had separate jobs, but they were all just humans, right? And so a multicellular organism that's a colonial organism is the same thing, where they're all the same species, right? They're just different members of the same species. But instead of all going and trying to do everything themselves, they differentiate or they, they sort of um, delegate different roles. Okay, the ones that are on the outside might uh, have their main job be secreting some mucus that keeps them safe. The ones on the inside might be focusing on photosynthesis. The ones uh, you know, that are near the top might be focused on movement or something like that, where we see these, these colonies that are all separate. They could all be pulled off and live on their own, but because they're not living on their own, they're specialized into one specific task. All right. Um, then we jump uh, to about 530 million years. I guess I don't want to write here. I'm gonna I'm gonna um, draw this line or draw this uh, bullet point, and then I'm gonna kind of bump it up here like this. So I have more room. Okay, this is gonna be the Cambrian explosion. Around 530 million years ago. Important things about the Cambrian explosion, not an explosion at all, no combustion involved in this. Um, this was what we call an explosion in the diversity of life, meaning there was a lot of new um, diversity that was going on at this point. And the reason for that was that um, these Hox genes started to evolve. And we talked about Hox genes yesterday and we said that they were the body plan genes, they're the ones that say, this isn't how you make a thorax, this is just where you put the thorax. Okay, so. You got all these other genes that control um, the formation of muscles and bones and things like that. And then they say like, okay, this, this big thing that you've put together over here is called a thorax. Put the thorax in between the head and the abdomen, okay? The Hox gene then gets slightly mutated, right? A little uh, missense mutation. Instead of having one thorax now, you have five thoraxes, right? And they're all in a row. And so you've got five of these arm sections. And uh, a, another small mutation might move an arm section above the head, right? So now you've got like little antenna or something like that on the head. And so it's these genes, these um, body plan genes that lead to rapid sort of uh, differentiation of species. And when I say rapid, I'm talking about the course of maybe 20 million years or so, which doesn't seem rapid, but in the course of the geologic time scale actually is, okay? Uh, so the next little thing that I'm gonna put in here is um, going to be the dinosaurs, right? So the dinosaurs were about 230 million years ago, so maybe like here, and then down to about here. Okay, this is the age of the dinosaurs, so I'll move it up here. First dinosaurs around 230 million years ago. Last dinosaurs around 65 million years ago. It's quite a quite a long time to be here on Earth. Right, so we're 
over over 150 million years, dinosaurs reigned supreme, right? That's a it's a pretty pretty big period of time. Um, mammals have only been supreme for 65 million years, approximately. Um, hominids about two million years. So yeah, we're not we're nothing yet. We, we still got to last a pretty long period of time. Um, put this in perspective for you. I've got a, a short clip to show you. Yes. This is a movie called The Land Before Time. I'll show you. A, I'll show you a very short, 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 short clip. This is a pivotal scene in the movie, by the way. So Sharp Tooth there is a Tyrannosaurus Rex. Uh, Littlefoot, I think is his name, is uh, an Apatosaur. I don't remember the the uh, Triceratops' name. Lucy? Is it Lucy? There's one in Barney that's name is like Oh. T-Rex. Whack. <laughs> so there's Littlefoot's mom. So here's... They're fighting. Uh, uh, just to save you guys some heartbreak, let's just say that Littlefoot's mom is going to win and everything's going to be okay, and that's the end of the movie right there. Okay? Great. Um, so, we saw a pretty realistic fight there between an Apatosaur and a T Rex. So the T Rex, uh, you know, comes in and tries to eat him, and the Apatosaur smacks him with his tail and maybe hits him with his neck and things like that. Right? That's, that's probably how it happened. But I wanted to put this in perspective for you. Um, so the Apatosaur... Um, they lived about like 154 million years ago or something like that. Okay, that's where we find their fossils. Uh, and then they died off uh, around 150 million years ago. That's where we see the last Apatosaur fossil. Right? Then we see the Tyrannosaur. Okay, Tyrannosaurs, we see the first Tyrannosaur fossils uh, around 67 million years ago. And the last one's around 65 million years ago. Okay, so if we're keeping track here, that means that uh, there's what, like 80 million years that separate the Apatosaur and the Tyrannosaur, meaning that there was a gap of 80 million years between the time when the Apatosaurs existed and the Tyrannosaurs existed, right? So the odds of having a Apatosaur-Tyrannosaur fight are not good. They're about 80 million years not good, right? Um, to put that even to, into more perspective for you, there's only 65 million years that separate the Tyrannosaur and us, right? So 15 million years closer. We are 15 million years closer to the Tyrannosaur than the Apatosaur was to the Tyrannosaur. That's how long the dinosaurs were on Earth, right? Uh, and also you can see they were even there quite a bit of time prior to the Apatosaur. That whole movie is a lie. whole movie is just... Horrible, huge lie. <laughs> so have there been like a similar species of like so a patosaur and like all of their like Yep, all those like Brontosaurus and Brachiosaurus, those are all a patosaurs. Okay. Oh, I see. So like were there like different time periods that dinosaurs were Yep. Yep. Alright. So <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Have, they don't have ones with, like, like, 
What's that, the Apatosaurs? Yeah. Not many. That's why they lasted for four million years. Not many. You don't you don't live for four million years by getting in a lot of fights. I mean, like you gotta spar over territory and stuff like that, but there weren't like large things going around and eating apatosaurs at the time. That's kind of that was kind of their their thing. It's like, hey, I'm giant. You're not gonna eat me. It's kind of like a hippo now. Yeah. Nothing eats hippos. They're giant. <laughs> Uh, it's a good question. How do they go away if they're the best? Lack of resources. Disease. Big, big factors. What's that? Probably not. A patasaur is not really getting preyed upon by much. Yeah, yeah cat cataclysmic events. Definitely. Yeah. All right. So, um, down here. About right here. First, hominids. Two million years ago. So, <laughs> hominids are uh, all of the uh, species that have the genus Homo, right? So, Homo sapiens, Homo habilis, Homo erectus, things like that, right? Um, there were some sort of human-like, um, species that, that were before that, um, but for the most part, we consider the hominids to be the beginning of the human sort of reign here, okay? And then, um, Homo sapiens, that's us, right? We've been around for significantly less time than that, around 200,000 years. Okay, so these Homo sapiens that were around 200,000 years ago, they were uh, very different from what we think of Homo sapiens. Uh, they were just trying to survive. They were they were going around and sort of living uh, these, this nomadic life where they were just moving, you know, from one place to another place. They were warring with other um, hominids at the time, um, and it wasn't until about 70,000 years ago. that the Homo sapiens actually moved out of Africa. Okay, so again, putting things into perspective, Homo sapiens have existed for 200,000 years. Right? The average time that a species spends on Earth is 2 million years. Okay? That means that we have 1.8 million years to go. Right? We're like 10% of the way through our lifespan, according to the average. Right? I don't know about you guys. I know I won't be around, but I'll be stoked if humans get to like three, the year 3,000. Like, that's like the goal, my eyes on the prize, right? <laughs> That's like 900 years from now ish, right? That seems like a seems like a really long time. Think of all the things that have happened in the past 80 years, and then think of another 900 years, and right? that seems like a lot. And then think of 1.8 million more years. That's like it's an insane amount, right? <laughs> Are we going to make it? No. No, probably not. All right. Um, will anything make it, you think? Anything? Well, uh, not anything, but like, is there something like right now that like, is the best? If you were to bet. Yeah, yeah, if you were to bet, exactly. I think, I think the thing that's going to decide it is how exactly humans decide to destroy humanity. So many ways. Yeah, there's, there's so many possibilities. I mean, freshman biology, we watched the video about how ants were going to outlive. Ants are, ants are pretty cool. Yeah. They, they could have a chance. If anything's going to take over the world, it'll be ants. Like, what is I can see that. I remember this was like in my seventh grade. My teacher was really late to get into it. Like, this TV series. And it was talking about how, like, the different time periods and the creatures that rule. Uh huh. 
Uh huh. Yeah. So the thing about giant insects is um, the way the way that insects get uh, their oxygen is through diffusion. They have these little holes in their body called tracheids, right? Um, and so it allows for oxygen to diffuse directly into their bloodstream through these little holes. Um, and so in order to be giant like that, you have to have a lot of oxygen to support all of the you know, giantness. Um, and so the tracheids are the same size and there's, you know, maybe more of them on a giant organism. But the key is that that surface area to volume ratio says that you have to keep it small if you want to be able to diffuse enough oxygen in to support it. Okay. So anytime that there were giant insects, the other thing that we know about is that there must have been a significantly higher quantity of oxygen in the environment. Okay. But the bad part about that is that if there's a significantly higher quantity of oxygen, there's a higher percentage of oxygen, that means that um, there's going to be less of other things like less methane gas, less CO2. And so if you have less methane and less CO2, those things are, are greenhouse gases. And so it's not sustainable because the earth will then cool. You'll go through a global cooling and that will then kill off the insects and killing off the insects will cause them to decay and release methane, which will then increase the quantity of uh, greenhouse gases, which will warm the earth up back up again. So these periods where there's a large amount of oxygen are not sustainable. Um, even though they create crazy things like giant insects, again, they're not things that can happen for extremely long periods of time. So, I want to talk about continental drift. Okay, we started talking about it yesterday. You guys saw um, Pangaea, right? How long ago was Pangaea? Where should I put it on my list? Days of yore, yesteryear. Uh, it was the breaking up of it was around right here. Okay, so this point right here. We can say Pangaea breaks apart. Again, around 250 million years ago. Now the question is, why? Why now? Let's look at the whole sort of history of the Earth. Boom, 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 boom. Pangaea breaks apart right then. Why there? Yeah. Nope. It's actually a super lame reason, right? And the, the reason is because uh, that's the supercontinent that we decided to name. So Pangaea breaks apart because that's a supercontinent that we're like, hey, that's a supercontinent. But it wasn't the first supercontinent by any means, right? And the continents have been moving around for as long as they've existed, right? Which is, you know, four billion years or so. So these continents continue to sort of shift around and shift around and shift around. Sometimes they, they migrate all the way south to the South Pole. Sometimes uh, they migrate north. Sometimes they break apart. Sometimes they come together. It's not like they're bouncing around the world like this, right? They're, they're you know, shifting all around. These tectonic plates are shifting them uh, in a lot of different fashions. It just happens to be that the one that we um, sort of put the most stake in because it allows us to figure out the uh, ancestry of mammals is Pangaea, right? And uh, so we know that Pangaea, 250 million years ago, existed when um, the common ancestor of all mammals existed. And so we know that uh, the reason why mammals are so similar all, all throughout the earth uh, is that when they evolved, when that one common ancestor of, of mammals evolved, there was just one continent. And then it broke apart. And then after it broke apart, there was um, uh, geographic isolation between them. And that geographic isolation is what led to all the different types of mammals that we see now. Um, but uh, there was a common ancestor about 250 million years ago. Yeah? Africa is connected. To Europe. Yeah, I can walk through the little sliver. It's actually a really big sliver. It's not like 
it's not like a bridge or anything. It's like it's a vast expanse, right? So, uh, why? So, so if, if um, we're in the age of the mammals now, and the dinosaurs were here, why mammals? Why did mammals come next? First of all, let's talk about mass extinctions. What killed off the dinosaurs? A Probably a meteor, right? Crashed into or an asteroid crashed into the Earth. Okay, well, that's bad. Did it kill them instantly? No. No, it took a really long time to kill them. Almost a million years it took to kill off the dinosaurs, right? A million years! Longer than the period of time that, that Homo sapiens have existed. Right? Significantly longer. Five times longer. That's how long it took to kill off the dinosaurs. Right? Some of them were really holding on. Right? They were like, no, we're going to be fine. I promise. And then they, they eventually died off as well. Right? But some of them died immediately because of this massive impact. But most of them died because of the horrible conditions that existed after that. Right? So why did mammals survive then? Yeah? Is it because they were killing off the dinosaurs? Were the mammals were killing off the dinosaurs? Nope. They were the, uh, I'll give you a hint. The mammals that were living at the time were like little rats. They like burrowed around and stuff. Yeah. Did they like kill the niches that the That's a big part. Why could they, they, she said they, they filled the niches, but why were they able to fill those niches? What do you think? Uh, because since they were so small, they could like scavenge for They were good scavengers for sure. Yeah. Oh, they had to t well, the dinosaurs were definitely predators, but their predators were dying. Yeah. Yes, so that was helpful for them. Another really important thing was they were mostly burrowing organisms, and so a lot of these horrible conditions that existed, like um, terrible acid rain uh, from volcanic eruptions and, and uh, large temperature swings, they were less affected by because they could burrow underground. And then the thing that was the most important Warm-blooded, right? So there were these massive temperature swings that were happening because uh, there was all this dust in the atmosphere and the dust was at some points blocking out the sun, right? At some points it was trapping in the sun's rays. And so massive temperature swings are going on. Reptiles being, uh, or dinosaurs rather, being uh, cold-blooded are then swinging their metabolism. So sometimes they're, it's so cold that they can't move. And sometimes that it's so warm that their metabolisms are going so fast that they can't get enough food to support those metabolisms, right? But you've got the mammals, and the mammals are just keeping it cool all the way. They're, they're just warm-blooded. They're keeping the same metabolism. Now, the bad news is that normally when you have a warm-blooded metabolism, you're taking more energy. But in a case where the temperatures are swinging so much, they only support uh, warm-blooded metabolisms. What else lived? Mammals. What's up? Sure, insects could live. Uh, yeah, crocodiles and alligators are our descendants of, of the dinosaurs, right? So why did they live? And birds, yep. We'll, get, we'll go back to birds. But why crocodile, crocodiles and dinosaurs? Yeah. Is it because they can't go underwater? Because they were in the water. So just like burrowing in the land, right, uh, going underwater was very helpful to them. Birds. Let's talk about birds. Why birds? What size are birds? Smaller. That helped them because they needed less less food. What other key fact about birds was very similar to mammals? What? Warm blooded. Yes, they're also warm blooded. Okay, and so these things made them superior. Therefore, they were able to fill all these ecological niches that were left open by the dinosaurs. And uh, so you had these little rat-like organisms that were now climbing up in trees and swimming in the water to get their food. And uh, you know, still some that burrowed, and they they then adaptively radiated into all these different niches. Uh, and we can tell that there's a fairly recent common ancestor because uh, the similarities in our genomes are very uh, are large amounts of similarities. Um, but they're now highly specialized for these specific um, niches. What sharks are on the team? A what now? What sharks are on the 
Yeah, the, the oceans were not as affected by the KT extinction as land um, animals were. Land, yeah, land animals. What about turtles, though? I don't know how old turtles are. Were there turtles during dinosaurs? That's a good question. I've never thought about it. Turtles. <laughs> I think we need to look that up. <laughs>